Well, welcome, Amy and Kristen. It is so awesome to have you on this show, especially in October. And I am excited that we're doing this episode in October because as everyone or a lot of people know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And there are so many pieces of information that we need to get out to our community. And it turns out that October is a very, very significant month for me and very pivotal. I, all my life, I have, October has been my favorite month, literally my favorite month, number one, because it's my birthday month. Um, and my mother, who passed away four years ago this coming Friday, October 6th, her favorite month was October. She loved the fall season. She died in the fall. So it's just very pivotal and significant to me. And I have a lot of emotions that revolve around October. And now that I am a breast cancer survivor, it makes it even more significant and pivotal. So I have taken this passion project of mine and have had wonderful guests on my show, such as yourselves. And I just appreciate your being here. I know that both of you have a connection to cancers in your family. You both work for the Nevada Cancer Coalition here in Reno, Nevada. And so I would like to start out with asking you to share a little bit about your connection to cancer and why this is so significant to you. Amy, if you can start, that would be great. Yes. Thank you so much, Jamie, for having us. It's really a pleasure to be with you on this podcast. Um, yes, my connection to cancer, both of my grandmothers had breast cancer um, and I was very young. So it's kind of just those snippets of memories that I have of them. Um, but that has always stayed with me the older I've gotten and obviously getting into the oncology space. And my grandfather had metastatic melanoma. So I... I've always known that that has been a connection to me, and it took several years into my life to realize um, what that would be. And I, I think that that's really what drew me to oncology and uh, thankfully to the positions that I've had and, and get to do now with the coalition. Okay, great. Well, thank you for what you do. Thanks for sharing. Kristen? Yeah, my, my relationship with cancer is a little bit different than Amy's. I had two aunts that had cancer. One of them passed away from it and the other one is still alive. And it wasn't really something that was talked about in my family. So the aunt that passed away, I have no idea what type of cancer she had. Uh, no one ever talked about it. No one asked questions. Um, the other aunt, she had breast cancer twice and had a radical mastectomy um, and we didn't hear about it from her until years after um, her her cancer. So we didn't even know about it when it was happening. Um, my grandfather also had cancer. There's speculation, oh, maybe it was the liver, maybe it was the kidneys. I can't get a straight story because it's just not talked about in our family. Um, we don't go into the details. And so... Um, for me, working for the Nevada Cancer Coalition and working in cancer is so important because I think it getting people to talk about cancer and to learn more about it and understand what they can do to prevent it or find it earlier when it's easier to treat, I think is so important. Um, and so that's really why I do what I do is because I think it needs to be more of a conversation. Well, and thank you for doing that because I, it is absolutely necessary that we talk about it. I'm super open about it. And I always wonder why other people aren't. I know people are very private about it. And with your family, the dynamics was super private and they, they may not have, they didn't even have social media to blah, put it out there. And, um, I've, I've just been super open about it because I've run into some things where I've needed to get second opinions and advocate for myself. And so thank you for recognizing that need to really be more open and talk about it. Um, I appreciate both of you sharing and it just it really warms my heart that you, you are willing to share that with everyone. Uh, Amy, earlier in the season, 
I had Carrie Harrington, who also works at Nevada Cancer Coalition, on my show, and it was an amazing conversation. She ha- provided such crucial information, and I know that you have some things that you want to add on to that, um, especially with Thrive NV. Um, how? So, what is Thrive NV? Number one, just to remind my audience, and who's it for? How do people access it? And any information you want to share? Yeah, thank you so much. We just thought that this was a great opportunity to go a little bit deeper into this, especially in light of the awareness um, of access to resources, which we really want to talk about today. And as Kristen mentioned, the need for early detection. So all of that will be very much a part of our conversation today. Um, But a little bit more about Thrive NV is that it is a community-based patient navigation program that was started um, by Nevada Cancer Coalition. And the whole point of it is to increase access to patient navigation, peer support, and resources for people affected by cancer in our state of Nevada. And we kind of started this with really an emphasis on rural and underserved communities and really anyone who would not otherwise have access to a navigator. So again, trying to fill those gaps where uh, where they may exist and, and kind of help people to navigate that a little bit better. Um, and so we do that by helping people overcome their barriers to cancer screenings, you know, because we look at it as a continuum, right? We all need to be um, doing our cancer screenings to detect cancer early when it can be treated. Um, so we want to help people get access to screening. We want to help them if they're already diagnosed and in treatment and seeking resources. Um, so all the way from screening through survivorship and even into the end of life, if people are looking for resources, that's what our program is here to try to do. So again, reducing gaps in access to resources and navigation support, working with existing navigators in our state, because we do have some really wonderful um, navigators and other people within the community that serve in these roles already. And it's not about duplicating efforts or taking away from what anyone is doing. It's about creating um, a network of support and more strength so that there's more of us doing this work Uh, to help those that really need it. Um, And this really came from uh, the foundation of Thrive NV came out of a survivor focus group that uh, was conducted by the coalition in 2017. And Kristen uh, was did such amazing work on that um, even before I was part of the coalition. So it's really exciting to be able to um, know that she and all of the work that, that she did kind of created that foundation. And then I got to come in and and kind of see it happen with the help of others. So um, with that survivor focus group, we learned from survivors and caregivers across the state of Nevada, what their needs were, what their experiences were as they went through treatment. And it was really important for us to know that because obviously we, we want to have the data. We want to be able to support the programs that we're putting together and know that they're going to serve a purpose for people. Um, and so we heard from people that that um, those that had access to a navigator tended to have a more positive experience. And, and most of that centered around having access to resources earlier, not feeling as alone in in that process. Um, and especially there was a need for that in our rural and frontier communities, too. People were looking for access to palliative care and support services early on in their treatment, not not at a much later stage when perhaps they could have benefited from it earlier. Um, and again, a lot of um, responses around the need for more resources and support for caregivers, which we know is an incredibly important thing to provide. Um, and we're proud to be able to do that too. Um, and access to reliable information. So all of those themes came up through that focus group and created the foundation for Thrive NV. So taking all of that information, we were able to develop Thrive Envy program May of 2020 um, with the help of our um, partners at the state and statewide partners and members of the coalition to come together and realize that this was a need for people. And we wanted to put this program together for that. 
So it brings that community-based patient navigation, access to peer-to-peer -peer support through um, a great partnership that we get to have with Immerman Angels that is a national organization um, that helps those dealing with cancer and their caregivers to get support from a mentor. Um, and so we, we were able to create all of that. And three years later, we're just so proud of what, what we've been able to create again with a lot of help from everyone. Um, and so our, our program is really for any adult in Nevada who's affected by cancer, who doesn't have access to navigation support. So that's kind of the, the quickest way to put it. Um, and again, we're here to connect people if they're looking for where to get screened um, for cancer, all the way through if they're looking through for resources uh, throughout the continuum of care and even toward the end of their life. Um, we're here for the patients themselves and their caregivers. And making space for caregivers was incredibly important to me in creating this program because caregivers um, over the years have been asked to do so much more than they ever were before. And they are such a pivotal part of the care team for everyone. And I just, it was really important to me that they, that they had the space to reach out and know that there are resources for them. And there are navigators like us that are going to listen to their issues and their barriers and try to help them find resources to overcome those. Um, and we have three navigation staff with the coalition. So um, I'm one of them up in Northern Nevada. And then we have two bilingual staff members in Las Vegas, which we're very grateful to have them because of course it's allowed us to reach our Spanish speaking community that needs to have um, access to these resources and, and be heard in a way that they were not before. And then people can access um, Thrive NV a couple of ways. They can just call us if that's the easiest way. Um, but we've also created a website. It's thrivenv.org. It's a dedicated place where people can go on, request navigation by filling out a, a simple online form just to give us a little bit more information about who they are, uh, what they're being treated for, and what they're resource needs are so we can um, be able to connect them appropriately. They can learn more about access to peer-to-peer -to -peer support with Immerman Angels. They can uh, provide a survivor story or look up some um, resources on our community groups. And then Kristen does a great job of pulling together a lot of information in our learning center. So we tried to create um, a little more of a sense of community within that website, but also knowing that not everyone has access to technology and maybe doesn't want to be on technology. Uh, so a, a simple phone call will get them to us anyway. I love the information. I want to hear more about Immerman Angels because I've always had it in my head that every cancer patient needs to have a mentor of some sort. I, you know, I had a lot of friends who supported me, uh, but it doesn't really, I mean, it matters. It really, really matters. But in the end, cancer, even though you may have a million people around you, is such a lonely road. There's just so much that goes into your mental health and, you know, the physical, everything that having that connection to the community is so, so important. I had no idea that Nevada Cancer Coalition even existed. I didn't know that uh, Cancer Community Clubhouse existed. And so if it was, and so I'm the type of person to reach out and get resources. I had a good navigator at Renown. Um, and I really just believe that every single person, no matter who you are, they need to have that access. So this just warms my heart to have you there and that you guys have built such a wonderful community and continuing to build that community. Kristen, did you have something to add to that? It did. When we did the focus groups with survivors back in 2017, um, that's actually one of the things that we heard from a lot of the survivors that we spoke with was that they wanted someone to talk to. They wanted someone who'd been there, who understood what they were going through, um, to talk to. And so it was interesting because 
we spoke to people who were diagnosed with all different types of cancers in all different stages. And some of the people who had cancers other than breast cancer said, oh, well, you know, the breast cancer survivors are lucky because they have these breast cancer specific support groups that they can go to. Um, but then we had a metastatic uh, thriver uh, who said, you know, that's that's great, but I can't go to these breast cancer survivor groups because they don't understand what I'm going through as a, as a person diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And then we had other people who said, you know, there's nothing in my community. There's no one in, in my community that understands what it's like. And so, you know, you can, different people can point and say, oh, well, you have more access than I do to support. But the bottom line was, is that overall, everyone felt like they needed that peer mentorship. They needed someone to talk to um, and they weren't getting that. And so that's one of the things that I think we really do love about Immerman Angels and having that partnership is, is they work to match people that um, have similar diagnoses and if possible, have a similar type of kind of community access and community environment. Um, and just recently, they added another feature where they can connect people who have similar interests in clinical trials and participating in clinical trials. So that if somebody, you know, if we have someone in Nevada who's who's being offered opportunity to participate in a clinical trial during their treatment or even, you know, another aspect of, of their cancer, um, they can connect with a, a peer mentor who can speak to them about what that's like. So it's, Thank you. it's yeah. really exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. It's totally brilliant too. I was like, I'm thinking in my head, hey, everybody has met, we need a mentor. Oh, good. Okay. Apparently I'm on the same wavelength as everyone else. <laughs> so yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so Amy, when it comes to working with survivors and caregivers that call Thrive MV, what sorts of resources are people often looking for, I know that they're looking for mentorship. I know that they're looking for navigation. Is there anything else that you can add to that as far as, like, I know that we, even with barriers, if they're in rural areas, they don't have technology, if uh, they don't speak English or whatever, um, what are some of the other things that they face and how can they better access and use those resources. Yeah. And I mean, it's true. We kind of touched on it earlier that, you know, we know that people dealing with cancer are facing layers of challenges. Um, and those, they could already come into, to their diagnosis with a lot of different, um, social concerns and then adding cancer on top of that, um, doesn't help. And then depending on where they live in the state and access to some of those resources, including medical care, I mean, all of those things can compound, um, the concerns that people have and, you know, people continue to kind of echo like what we've heard in our own survivor focus group study and what we know with the national level, um, like with groups like National Coalition of Cancer Survivorship, every year they do an annual survey of cancer survivors and caregivers, again, to kind of keep a keep a sense of what's going on across the nation. And and the themes kind of remain the same. It's, um, you know, the need for more of coordinated care, um, knowing information and access to resources earlier having information to make empowered decisions with their care team, kind of knowing if there are decisions to make and having the time to do that. Um, and again, just more, more support in general from the community. So those things, you know, are, are a pretty common theme across the nation. And we hear that again, you know, just with the, the patients that we're able to talk to. Um, and, and what we've discovered, too, with our program that I think is really unique and, and worth mentioning is that because we function out of a coalition, we truly are a community-based program. So we may still get calls from people who are being seen at a major center, and they may not know who their support people are yet or what those resources are yet. And then we may be getting calls from people in rural Nevada who they're just diagnosed and they don't even know what questions to ask, you know, so it's, it's the entire spectrum um, of what we may see. And we found that we have been able to be a resource to not only 
the patients or survivors and caregivers themselves, but also to other community partners or organizations or clinics. So they may be seeing patients and not knowing what resources are available and reaching out to us within our navigation program to learn about resources too. So it's kind of been a really interesting um, kind of non-traditional model, if you will, of navigation, which I think has been really powerful and has shown us, again, the power of that network idea of, um, you know, people knowing that we're here and knowing that we are here to try to help connect people to resources, no matter where they're coming from, or if they're themselves dealing with cancer, or if they're already somebody helping someone with cancer. Um, but kind of a, a, some more specifics, Jamie, you're asking, you know, what people are calling for and what their challenges are. I mean, since our program has started over three years ago, we've had 360 calls and that is that includes everyone like caregivers, survivors and, you know, the different partners that I mentioned, too. So it shows us, again, that power of the need for information that people are seeking. Um, there have been over 520 barriers that people have reported to us, and the top ones are probably not going to be surprising to anyone, but the number one is financial, mm -hmm. which is heartbreaking to say the least. And I wish after all these years that my magic wand would start working and I could fix all of these things, but um, that isn't the case. Um, so financial continues to be the number one reported barrier for people that reach out to us. Um, the, other than that, there's looking for support resources, again, could be support groups, peer to support, support, things like that, or some that are undocumented as well. Um, and then transportation is another big one. And then um, resources shared, those of us in the navigation team, we've shared over um, about 850 different resources that we try to share with people based on what they tell us their barriers are to try to connect them um, to overcome those barriers. So again, those would be things like um, helping them get connected to financial assistance applications and services and we have to use an approach of using both local organizations because we're very lucky in both the north and south of Nevada to have um, some financial assistance organizations for people with cancer. But, you know, it's not an infinite amount of resources that are available to everyone. So we also look at the national level and kind of see how we can piece resources together to help people um, overcome the barriers that are most significant to them, um, connect people to support groups, counseling, um, discount medical programs, um, the marketplace, if they're able to get on insurance, if that's even an option. So those are some of the examples of, of what we've seen. And again, it's highly dependent on, on a lot of different factors when the people call, you know, where they live. Um, and then we're constantly trying to keep on top of resources across the state, because again, we are a statewide program. Um, and so we're able to keep up with some of those resources too, by working with other statewide partners and, and trying to, you know, trying to know what's going on so that when people call, we're able to connect them appropriately. Um, but the needs of people are are very complex. I mean, I can't stress that enough. And I've been doing this for quite a while now, and they've just gotten to be more and more layered for people. And, um, you know, I think we as a, a community that care so deeply about um oncology patients and their families, like we really have a, a responsibility here to realize what's going on with people and how how we can help um, no matter where we are, because everyone has has something that we can do within our circles to to try to help others. So I think that's just a it's a challenge, but that's what's that's what's so important about programs like ours. That's why we're we're happy we're here. We can't fix everything, but we sure do try to to connect people to resources that will will help them because they deserve that. Yes, they do. And it's it's complex, it's overwhelming, it's scary and to have a mentor that can actually 
you know, be in connection with you during your journey and helping you sort of unravel some of the things and, and lead you to those resources because there are, it is so overwhelming. And those people who don't even have a caregiver, it can be even more overwhelming. And because this is a podcast, I have a wider audience that goes outside of, of, of Reno. And I'm hoping that people who are listening to this are able to understand what we have here in Nevada and perhaps seek out something that's similar in their area and maybe at some point even become involved with that organization after, you know, they have become cancer free and in their healing, uh, in, in the healing part of their journey, because it, it does tend to be pretty healing, especially if you are a cancer survivor doing something like this for the community is everything. And so I know that this podcast is for me. So I like, again, I love the fact that there's a mentor that can help people. Okay. So Kristen, we're going to uh, transition over to you uh, because this is uh, breast cancer awareness month. There is a program called paint Nevada pink. And I would like to know how paint Nevada pink fits into Thrive NV and the rest of Nevada Cancer Coalition's work? Uh, so that's a, that's a great question. So um, Pain Nevada Pink is probably about as old as Thrive NV. It launched, actually, it's a little older. It launched, I believe, in 2019. Um, and it came about, so it came about actually in a similar way to Thrive NV in that we, as a coalition, have uh, what we call task forces and collaboratives. And that's kind of our work groups of how we get work done. So we bring together partners um, to work on different topics. So Thrive NV actually came from our survivor um, task force and Paint About a Pink came from our breast cancer work group. So we were hearing from a lot of our partners that our screening rates were low. How do we address this in our state? How do we get more people screen for breast cancer and get those rates up. And one of the challenges that we found was that there were inconsistent screening guidelines. And so one organization is telling people to start screening at age 50. Another organization is saying 40. Is it every year? Is it every other year? And a lot of women were saying, you know what, if the expert organizations can't agree on one screening recommendation, how important could it really be? Like, if I put it off a few years, is it really going to matter? And that's not an attitude that we, we want to see in, in, with, when it comes to cancer screening. And so partners in Nevada came together, those partners that do breast cancer screening and make recommendations to patients to go get screened. They came together and we said, let's form a unified screening recommendation. And so they went with that. And they went with the um, American College of Radiology, which is... Uh, screening to start at, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's the uh, breast surgeons, it's, uh, national breast surgeons. And they went with starting at age 40 and screening every year. And so Pain of Atta Pink was originally a celebration of just partners coming together and saying, let's all recommend the same thing. And so it started from there. It has grown each year. So, you know, through the pandemic, it was a little interesting because we couldn't have these big outreach events. And, and so how do we paint Nevada pink when everyone is stuck at home? And so we lit things up pink, you know, we, in Nevada, fortunately, we have casinos that have all kinds of colored lights. And so <laughs> we had everything lit up pink. And we promoted, you know, breast cancer awareness and taking a pledge to get screened for breast cancer. And so for the past several years, that's kind of been our push is, is take a pledge to get screened within the 12, the next 12 months or remind a loved one to do so. And that's been great. But this year we said, you know, we've been asking people to take that pledge, but has it been resulting in more mammograms? And it really hasn't. We haven't seen the uptick in mammograms. And so what we wanted to do this year was um, go a step further and say, don't just take the pledge, actually call and schedule your mammogram. So we launched this mammogram match campaign. And for every mammogram that 
someone calls and makes an appointment for during the month. So they just pick up the phone and call and make that appointment in October. They don't have to have their mammogram in October because there's only so many appointments and October is very busy month for mammograms. So as long as they call and pick up the phone and make that appointment, for every appointment that they make, our sponsor at United Healthcare is going to donate a dollar to our cancer assistance fund to help other people get screened for breast cancer or get diagnostic tests or get navigation. And that's part of where it ties in with Thrive NB is that, as Amy had mentioned, uh, people have challenges just accessing screening. People have challenges getting transportation to screening. And so where it ties in is that we can encourage people to make that appointment but they may not have the financial resources to pay for a mammogram. They don't have insurance. And so Thrive and the navigators can direct them into a payer source. They can get them signed up for Women's Health Connection. They can direct them to a free screening program like the uh, Red Rose program at Dignity Health in Southern Nevada. So looking for those financial resources to get them screened, looking for physical resources. So for example, they may not be aware that we have a mobile mammography truck in the state. And so connecting them with that, looking at the schedule and saying, okay, well, this truck will be in your community on these dates and, and here's how you can get an appointment there or finding, you know, different screening facilities. Transportation is another big issue that Amy had mentioned. So looking for, um, rideshare vouchers or bus passes so that people can get to their screening appointments. And so really when it comes to, you know, to Thrive NV, a lot of it is about survivorship, but a lot of it also is about, you know, getting people to screenings so that perhaps they don't have to go down that, that cancer road. They can get screened early um, and hopefully have, you know, a clear mammogram. And if they don't, they're already connected to Thrive NV. So they can get navigation straight out of the gate to get diagnostic testing and get connected with the resources that they need during treatment. And so, again, as Amy mentioned, it's a continuum. Um, and so Paint Nevada Pink is just very, very, very early on that continuum of getting screened and encouraging people to go out and schedule that mammogram and actually get it. And we, we use Paint Nevada Pink also as a really big opportunity to educate people about screening which I think we learned is very important. We did, uh, at, the, at the Cancer Coalition, we love to research things. And so we did another series of focus groups and surveys about breast cancer screening uh, earlier this year across the state. And one of the things that we found is that a lot of myths still persist about breast cancer screening. And people have a lot of fears and people don't talk about it. Um, and so really Paint Nevada Pink is about um, take, you know, drawing back the curtains and saying, here's the information. These, these are myths. Here's the reality. Here's what you can expect. Here's why it's important to talk about it. And beyond talking about it, let's just, you know, here's the resources to act on it. Go get screened. So with those, uh, with the screenings, they are the basic screenings or they don't go into diagnostics or anything like that, especially with the mobile screening. But if there's something that is showing that's suspicious, that is when we can direct them into, uh, you know, getting the resources to get diagnostics and, and going forward from there. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. So we just want people to get screened with their, yep. their screening mammograms. So that's your basic 3D mammogram. Um, with programs like Women's Health Connection, which have income require, you know, there's eligibility requirements that you have to meet. But when you, in, if you, if you qualify for that program, when you enroll in it, it covers your mammogram. And then if you need to have additional screening based on the findings of that mammogram, that program will cover that as well. Okay. Um, in other programs and like the mammal van, mobile mammography truck, they just have the 3D machine. So if there's additional need, then they can help get you connected to diagnostics. And mm -hmm. that's another area where Thrive NV can jump in and provide assistance if you need transportation or financial support to get that done. Awesome. 
Awesome. So when does, uh, are, are we pink yet? We are <laughs> pink. We okay. are pink all month long, all through October. So I need to, so are the casinos lit up or anything like that? How, what is it? What's it looking like at nighttime? Because I haven't been out at nighttime. Is anything? You know, it's, it's a little hit and miss uh, only because this year we have focused less on the actual turning things physically pink and a little bit more on, um, you know, I guess going pink in your heart uh, okay. to make that scream. So we focus a little bit on the physical, a little bit less on the physical and a little bit more on the action. Um, and so there's probably a little bit less pink around. Um, we didn't have a contact for the sphere in Las Vegas, but can you imagine that giant globe lit up pink? Um, with uh, with uh, U2 playing. Right. <laughs> That would be We need awesome. some connections. Yeah. yeah, we do. Here, I'll reach out to my connections. Um, you know, it's really interesting because when I first was diagnosed, my whole family came over here and we were all at our house. And I said, and I told everybody and I said, and just so you know, I, don't get me a bunch of pink stuff. I don't want pink stuff. And now I love pink. So I pink everything. And I'm like, you know, so I'm all about the pink. So I love that pink in our hearts and pink in our actions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and going and getting those mammograms. I literally have people who tell me that they haven't gotten a mammogram in like three years. And so when you say, what, what difference does it make if I wait another couple of years? It makes a huge difference. And yeah. during, during COVID, I was like super anxious because I wasn't able to get my mammogram when I normally do. And I actually ended up getting it in June of that year when normally I would get it several months prior. And I went to, in June that year and I was all clear. And then two years later, I have breast cancer. And so I've always been very, very good at going and getting them every single year. I even now get uh, little uh, pings on my phone saying, hey, it's time for your mammogram. So for, you know, for people to say, you know, I mean, they, everybody gets to make their own decisions, right? So we can only do as much as we can do, but having Nevada Cancer Coalition and the, you know, the programs that you have are so essential and crucial and yes, being loud about it, loud and clear. And again, Nevada Cancer Coalition is, is about all cancers and survivorship. And so just being there and having that navigation and having Immerman Angels, I'm loving that uh, program. I would love to hear even more about that because I kind of feel like I need to be part of that. Um, thank you. So to wrap up, what advice, Amy, and I know this isn't one of the questions, but I feel like you can answer this. What is <laughs> one of your number one pieces of advice? to people out there who are diagnosed with breast cancer or any cancer for that matter, what can you share? Oh, wow. That's a big question, Jamie. <laughs> um, well, I will do my best at that. I think my biggest advice would be to reach out and ask for help. And I know that that sounds easy because as we're highlighting today that, you know, resources can kind of be peppered around depending on where people are, are living um, and, and where they're coming from. But I am so happy to know that even in our state, and I, I'm sure and I hope other states are, are like this too, that there are oftentimes more resources than we realize. Um, and, and I discover that often too when I'm looking for things. So I think, you know, reach out to your doctor's office, reach out to um, the hospital if you're getting treated at a, at a major hospital, find out because many times these places will have a social worker, perhaps they will have a navigator. Again, that depends on where we are, but just in general, um, find out, you know, what resources are available within those treating clinics or facilities, because they will know if they're treating cancer patients, they're going to know if they have these contacts for you. Um, and then a next layer is looking for places like a coalition. If you're outside of Nevada, even if you're in Nevada, you know we're here, Nevada Cancer Coalition. 
but every state has a coalition of some kind or a program, not exactly like ours, but states are tasked with with reducing the burden of cancer within their state and their activities may look different, but there are people that care about doing this work everywhere. It's just finding those people. But if you ask and you reach out and you lean on your circle of people, I choose to believe that you will find those resources and get connected to what you're looking for, because there are there are a lot of good people out there trying to trying to help make this better for people because, you know, we're all touched by cancer. It just depends on what level and when. Yeah. And um, in a perfect world, it would be good for all oncologists, surgeons, providers <laughs> to have that information at their fingertips that they can hand to their individual patient. If they're seeing yes. that someone is struggling with something, I certainly struggled with some things in a perfect world. All of those people should be saying, you need to reach out to Nevada cancer coalition or the, you know, uh, cancer community clubhouse, whatever needs to be given to that patient directly from the actual provider from the oncologist. I just feel like in a perfect world that would happen. And I, so if you are an oncologist listening, a surgeon listening, please have this information at your fingertips so that you can give that to your patient who is truly, truly struggling. I, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds. I, and actually I don't even care. You need to do that. <laughs> um, so thank you, Kristen, what about you piece of, in, of advice that you, and by the way, Amy, that is an absolutely wonderful piece of advice. And if, if I had had it when I got diagnosed, that would have been really, really awesome. And I just sort of tumbled around and did it myself somehow and listened to some of my friends. So I feel like the efforts that we are putting into this podcast and your being on the show, hopefully will reverberate out to uh, everyone, right? So Kristen, what about you? Piece of advice that you can leave our audience? You know, I think that I feel like Amy kind of stole the show there with her answer. It was such a great answer. And I wholeheartedly agree. I think I come at it from a slightly different perspective in that, um, you know, my husband had a traumatic accident last year. And so we had a medical experience, not unlike um, what somebody diagnosed with cancer might face. And the whole time I was thinking to myself, gosh, we have all these resources available for people diagnosed with cancer, and we have nothing available for someone with this type of injury. And so it made me incredibly grateful for the services that we can provide through Thrive NV and that we have these types of supports for people diagnosed with cancer. So I wholeheartedly echo what Amy said about reaching out. Um, I think taking a deep breath before you reach out is extremely important. I think, um, you know, in addition to reaching out and asking for help, it is taking a step back and and looking for ways to invite calm into your life um, and making that a priority because I think that, um, you know, there's so much going on in our lives. And when you're talking about health and you're talking about health care, it can get very overwhelming. You know, we're not doctors. Uh, most of us aren't doctors and most of us don't work in the medical field. And so health can be overwhelming. And, and, Frankly, even for those people working in healthcare, it can be overwhelming. And so taking a step back and looking at your priorities and focusing on your mental peace of mind and making yourself feel as good as you possibly can physically, I think is important. So that's, you know, taking a hot bath and practicing box breathing and doing some of those calming things. Um, I think is so important so that when you're asking for help and you're being given that help, you're in a place to accept it and you're in a place to 
use it to um, improve your situation and to get the resources and help that you do need. So I think I think really kind of recentering, refocusing, setting those priorities, and kind of reminding yourself to breathe along the way. Um, and that really that applies to cancer screening. You need to do that when you're going in for a mammogram. Take a deep breath, stay calm, and you need to do that, you know, throughout a cancer journey. So I think that's really important. Yeah, very, very good advice. Well, number one, I hope your husband's okay. I hope he's recovering and good. I'm really glad. And number two, thank you for re reiterating and echoing, which is totally fine what Amy said and 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 continuing that on to talk about being calm and breathing, taking a deep breath and trying to bring that calmness into your life because it is very uh, overwhelming and it causes so much anxiety. And I like the fact that you talked about how we're not doctors, but even if you are a doctor in the medical field, it's really important for them to bring calmness into their life as well. And I just interviewed a wonderful nurse from renown, Amanda Thomas, a couple of months ago. And she it was talking, she's a nurse. She's one of the head nurses there in oncology. And she is all about mindfulness for healthcare providers and making sure that they also are practicing mindful breathing and meditation, bringing calm into their lives, because all of that totally affects them too. It affects their lives. They become close to, to patients and, you know, they lose patients. And so, um, I mean like patients, <laughs> um, but bringing that calmness into their lives. So thank you for saying that is such an important piece of, of, of advice to give. So I just want to thank both of you so much for being on this podcast. It, it is so important for us to speak, to reach out, to get our mammograms, any cancer screening for that matter. And I love the work that you're both doing. And I hope that my audience outside of Reno does look into their community for other coalitions. And I know you, I have some resources in the show notes from you. Can you share a little bit about what is going to be, I have a email addresses and phone numbers for both of you in there. And then there are some websites in there and some social media. I have you on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and then I have working for cancer free Nevada and Nevada Cancer Coalition website, Nevada Cancer Coalition, or the Thrive NV website. So I have all of those things in the show notes for anyone to access. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? I'd just like to say thank you so much for, for starting this podcast. I think it's so valuable for people to learn more and to kind of better understand um, something that might be very daunting. Um, I think it's just a great opportunity. So thank you so much for, for allowing us to join you. Thank you, Kristen. Amy? Yes, thank you so much. I echo Kristen's sentiments. This has been a great experience. And I I love seeing um, how you've taken this podcast. And it's such a healing space for so many people. And I, I'm grateful that we've gotten to be a part of that today. And something that I really want to end with, I think kind of um, piggybacking off of what you said, Jamie, with kind of challenging um, people to proactively provide information uh, to folks in the cancer continuum is just really that, you know, we are so proud of, of all of our programs. And obviously I'm really proud of Thrive NV and, and what we're able to do with this. Um, but I'm very aware that this is really just the beginning. You know, our program is not the answer for the long term. This is about, this is a starting point. This is hopefully an example. Um, my wish is that this will be an inspiration uh, for other organizations, you know, to see the value of, of navigation and support within their organization. Um, because I just, I fully believe of everything that we're doing, it really comes down to the fact that 
the more health systems and community organizations that have cancer support staff available, whatever that looks like, um, the, the larger of a proactive approach and a compassionate network of support is going to be available to people going through cancer. And that is, that is the answer. You know, the more people that are doing this work, then the more of that kind of network that we can all reach out to, to learn from, and then get people connected to resources sooner, which again, as I've said multiple times is what everyone deserves. So I just, you know, I just kind of want to leave on that, that, you know, we've, we've been able to see a need fill a gap with our small but mighty team and not without the the help of a large village of people that care about this. But I think we're we're in a time in our lives and our society where we all need to be doing a little more. And I would love to see um, other people kind of see where they can fill that need and get more support out there for people that need it. So I just thank you for the opportunity to share my feelings on that. You are so welcome. And thank you. And I have a few ideas that I'll share with you after we wrap up. So thank you very much again, Amy and Kristen. I appreciate your being on the show and sharing such valuable information. And to my guests, thank you very much for listening again. And we will see you on the next episode of Test Those Breasts.